Well, hello and welcome to Real Time, Canada's podcast for and about realtors, brought to you by the Canadian Real Estate Association. I'm Erin Davis. So glad you could join us for this enlightening conversation for our 27th episode. Now, I just want you to take a moment and give this some thought. While no country can be defined by a single architectural style, there's always a prevailing image, the Moorish Riyads of Morocco, Dubai sky-high contemporary landscape, the Renaissance aesthetic of Italy. But when we think of Canada, what comes to mind? On episode 27 of Real Time, we're joined by Newfoundland-born, Norway-based architect Todd Saunders, best known for his iconic design of the Fogo Island Inn and studios in Newfoundland and Labrador. A Canadian architect with a global presence, Todd joins Real Time to share his unique perspective on Canadian architecture and his approach to evolving it. We'll look at the influences that have shaped Canada's built environment and how a base understanding of these influences can help realtors add value. Todd, thank you so much for joining us. I wonder if we can go back a little bit. If you would tell us about your professional journey from Newfoundland and Labrador to Norway, which is where we're joining you today, how has your career unfolded? Uh, So the journey from Newfoundland to Norway is is from, it started when I was about 15. I left uh, Newfoundland, Uh, my dad work with Air Canada and we moved to Halifax in my last two years of high school there. And then I studied environmental town planning at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. And then I wanted to be a landscape architect. And I went to uh, Rhode Island School of Design to be an exchange student. And I touched into architecture when I was there. And then I was working in uh, Vienna and Berlin for a while when I was 21, 22. And then I did my master's degree at McGill University in um, I studied uh, ecological architecture and town planning, a master's degree in architecture. And then I, the, the weird thing was, it was um, for my master's thesis, I hitchhiked from Paris to China unexpectedly. I um, oh. got a bunch of scholarships to look at northern ecological communities. And one of the communities is actually in Norway. And uh, on my way there, I hitchhiked through Bergen and I kind of fell in love with the place. And a year after I was finished my master's degree, I came back. I didn't go my graduation at McGill. I put my thesis in the mailbox at the airport and I was gone before school was finished and uh, I was quite eager. And then in Norway, I started off, you know, I was 25, 26 years old, um, no contacts, just learning the language. And basically I started working really hard and I was kind of on the sidelines of architecture while I was building playgrounds for children and their parents at different schools. I did a wastewater treatment system with a bunch of architecture students. And then I actually got a teaching position at the Bergen Architecture School, and me and another guy teaching together started a company. Uh, We started building our own projects. Like There was a little cabin we built. We bought the land and built it ourselves. And that's actually how we first started our first experience with real estate agents where we project got published in the local newspaper and um, then we got 15 or 16 calls people wanted to buy it and we intended on keeping it but uh, we sold it after a couple of weeks we owned it and did really well economically on it and then started winning competitions and uh, it was a hard start because it took about three or four years before we got any really interesting projects so uh, it's like my early 30s before we started getting stuff built It seems like Norway may have, did it have some sort of familiarity within you Mm. to Newfoundland? Like, it's almost like that title of the award-winning documentary, Strange and Familiar. Did Norway feel at all like home? Because, of course, it is now. You've been there for almost 20 years, meeting your wife around 1995 or 96, and now there you are in Norway, planted like John Lennon's Norwegian wood. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. how is it that Norway resonated with you in terms of maybe comparison or familiarity to Canada? Uh, it was kind of like visually it was the same, but it's like economically, like Norway is one of the richest countries in the world. But at the same time, their country from farmers and fishermen. And I experienced that kind of upwards richness, wealth when I came here. But first, when I got here, it was still a lot like Newfoundland, kind of down to earth. And uh, the architecture was very low key, very practical. The landscape was the same. 
the food was the same. It was basically salt, pepper, dill, and fish, and then root vegetables. So the food was very similar. Culture, it's very, it's a bit different though. Like Newfoundlanders are extremely sociable, mm-hmm. uh, whereas um, Norwegians in the countryside are quite private. The, the city I live in, Bergen, they're kind of more like Newfoundlanders, very hospitable and talkative. I actually really like the city I live in, Bergen. I kind of I feel very at home. That's that's actually why I came here. I was actually um, supposed to live and work in Oslo, but um, it wasn't that interesting or different compared to Newfoundland and Bergen was. But it, there's a lot of similarities. But there, there are two different worlds if you start looking at it in detail. But architecturally, it was they're very complementary, and it really helped my career. You have said that you can't plan your life, but that you've carried your Newfoundland roots everywhere yeah. and a few things that you learned there that stick with you. What have you brought from Newfoundland to your life in Norway? I mean, I don't know if you've held any kitchen parties there in Bergen, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. what have you carried with you from Newfoundland as you've expanded your influences throughout the world? And we'll talk more about that coming up. Yeah, like Newfoundland has a very good rap now. It's kind of... People are looking at it in a positive way. We have, we have actually n- negative traits as well, but uh, there's an openness in Newfoundland and a hospitality. And Newfoundlander would give you their last you know, their shirt off their back. And, and there's like a honesty and directness in Newfoundland. It was kind of funny. You couldn't lie in Newfoundland because it was your integrity is your currency. And if you lied, it's such a small place. Within half an hour, everyone knew you lie. And then it was. Um, that then you lost your integrity and you're uh, you're yeah. worthless. So I, that that's been brought with me, like hard work as well. And then growing up on these little small islands, you become very independent because nobody's there to save you. Right. Somebody wrote a letter of recommendation for me for a professorship one time. And he described mm-hmm. it as a, I was like a person they could drop in the middle of Siberia and then come back nine months later and then I've started my own business and doing really well. It was kind of like, that's a Newfoundlander. There's like there's a survival instinct. It's like a tough life down there. There's you know, it's not, it's not leaning back and enjoying the, the flowers and the orchids blowing in the air. It's a tough climate and uh, and then there's humor. I mean, that's an, another thing. It's like it's hard to come across in a podcast here, but Newfoundlanders. There's I think that was the sauce of survival there. Humor. I think mm. that's uh, got me a long way over here. I think. Yeah. So I hope to God I haven't lost that. I was like. I'm sure you haven't. When we return with Norway-based Gander Newfoundland-born Todd Saunders, we'll talk about what he already knew long before the musical Come From Away. Whether you're listening in Goose Bay, North Bay, Hilliards Bay, or near the Bay of Fundy, you can tap into the knowledge of realtors across the country and share your own lessons and insights by visiting Realtors Corner on Crea Cafe. It's a hub of content created by Realtors for Realtors. Now, back to Todd Saunders. You left Newfoundland before 9-11, and of course, that was such a seminal time in Gander when the world's attention turned to the hospitality of Newfoundlanders, which can't have been a surprise to you, but now that is sort of the touchstone that I'm sure people around the world, if you say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm from Gander, Newfoundland, they go, oh, right, come from away, right? Mm-hmm. So this has been something else that's been added to your calling card sort of inadvertently, hasn't it? Yeah, and that was quite unexpectedly, but it was not a surprise at all. I think the numbers were uh, 9,000 people landed and 7,000 people living in the place and everyone got a place to sleep. But uh, that's, again, hospitality and... Uh, organizing things on the fly that's what newfoundlander is really good at because the weather changes like 15 times a day and you know you gotta you gotta adapt i wouldn't say malleable but adaptable and optimistic and and, and not really afraid of change i think that's what newfoundlander is there it's 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 always there with them so i think that's uh, an asset to kind of roll with the punches how much has that been integrated into your design philosophy, Todd, what is most important to you when approaching a project? You've already mentioned integrity is your currency. So that is a great foundation yeah. onto which you can build. So let's get into that a little bit, your design philosophy. Uh, it's, it's becoming more and more about wants and needs, trying to make architecture that's not overly, I wouldn't say it's, it's very well built and very well crafted. 
what I like about Newfoundland architecture, it's all handmade. You can feel it. Like wants and needs. I'm very, very focused on needs first. And when those are covered in architecture, then you can explore the wants if there is the economy there or then the need for it. But we kind of question it as well. It's like, do you really need that? And um, it ends up with really, really good discussions. So, uh, And then uh, another part of me is I'm an extremely curious person, and that's integrated into our process. And we work with clients that are really eccentric, and they got their economy in place. They're, like, stable, but they're always teaching us something. We're learning from them. They're learning from us. It's not all about attaining happiness in our architecture. It's more about learning. I think, in growth. Well, it goes back to what you talked about being the people from Newfoundland. They are flexible, malleable, the changing weather, the changing needs all the time. And so you come in with your skill set and then you get somebody who says, oh, I I want a soft ice cream machine in the bedroom, you know, something like that. So you have to kind of park your ego a little bit too, don't you, in terms of saying, okay, I wouldn't have done that, but it's what you want, right? Yeah, it goes both ways. Like we're we're kind of uh, clients that come to us are kind of they're a bit like us. So it's usually that's is the beauty of actually now we're getting like fifty two years old. It's and then like podcasts like this, and then we did we've done our third book now. People can read about our values, and we're attracting more and more people that want to help. You've also been doing some philanthropy, I understand. Mm-hmm. An information center in Maine for the woman who founded Burt's Bees? Yeah, uh, Roxanne Quimby contacted us a few years ago. That's under construction, and I was in a meeting yesterday about that. So it's um, they built the foundation last year, and I'll be going over again this summer. And then Roxanne, her son, Lucas, um, I think they used $20 million on the building and about $100 million uh, donated the, the money for the land. And now they found out about the work that we're doing on Fogo Island. We're moving more and more in that direction because the clients have uh, great motivations. And so the, the developers, uh, we work with some of them. We, we try to focus on quality. But at the end of the day, it's about making money. And it it's a business, that part. Whereas my personal interest is actually working with a philanthropist because they have the money and, and their intention is just to make the best possible architecture. And then it's usually for a good cause. And then it's a great alignment of our values and their values. So it's uh, it's, it's a very interesting field. And we just uh, publishing an article now about called Architecture and Philanthropy, a Catalyst for Change. Full Island, for example, there's the inn has created 70 small businesses on that little island. Wouldn't that be fantastic if you made a building that could generate its own economy? Mm. And that's what we're trying to interest in now, like uh, not just being a drain on an economy and a, and a maintenance nightmare. It's a building that actually gives back. So we're trying to move in that direction. There's not many clients out there, like the client at Fogo Island Inn, like Zeta Cobb and then Roxanne Quimby at the Katahdin National Park. They're, they're hard to find. But when you find them, they're, it's fantastic. So let's talk about coming home. And how do you feel architecture impacts the way that we live, interact with, or appreciate a place? I think architecture, when done with care and with love, can create care and love. That, that's, oh. uh, and then that's the, what the saddens me now is there's a lot of architecture that's half designed. Uh, it's like good enough. And it's a bit sad because these things last for hundreds of years. And then, like the homes we create, there's only actually been one of them's ever been sold. People fall in love with these places, and then, and then um, things like the Fogo Island Inn, for example, it's I love that place. It's uh, oh. I was there. There was a woman I met on the roof one time. My two daughters were in one hot tub, and her husband was in another hot tub. We started talking. She was a psychology professor, so we could be open really quickly. Um, then I asked her why she was there and she goes, well, my husband's going to die in six weeks. He's a, has a terminally ill disease and um, going to take euthanasia. And he said, this is one of the places he wanted to visit before he died. Mm. And to talk not only about the end of life, but the beginning of life too, because in your experience, you've had like a handful of clients whose children have become architects, just yeah. kind of hanging around the Todd Saunders effect. Or what was that? What? How did that come to be? 
Yeah, I don't know how that was. It just started happening. It was like <laughs> uh, it was like you you were with these families and these little nine ten year old kids were often there at the office hanging out, and then you meet them afterwards, and then they say, "Yeah, my son's an architect," and then my daughter became an architect and works in the city now, and maybe living in these houses probably does affect them on some type of level. And then they probably see the love and care we put into these things. Exactly. It was such a positive effect. Yeah. And they probably see their family's experience and joy, like making, creating something. It's a big deal. Like starting from nothing and then creating something which you live and creating these layers of memories. Todd Saunders, creator and architect of the Fogo Island Inn and Studios in Newfoundland and Labrador, talks about that gorgeous labor of love shaping history and the future when we come back. When we discuss labors of love, volunteering often comes to mind. And as a realtor, when you volunteer your time, make a donation, or raise funds for your favorite cause, you're making a difference in your own community. Help amplify this great impact and maybe even inspire others to do the same by sharing your story online using hashtag RealtorsCare. Designing the Fogo Island Inn, and we've referred to this throughout our chat today, and I couldn't wait to get to this, and I really do urge people to find the documentary Strange and Familiar, an award-winning film about your heart's work. I won't say your life's work because you are a young man, yeah. but designing the Fogo Island Inn was a milestone in your career, Todd. What was it like to honor the island's history while in some ways shaping a vision for new architecture in the area? So this is a place, you know, it's one of the poorest provinces in the country, always been, and there's not many architects there. I already practiced for about 10 years, and I never thought I'd make a piece of architecture in Newfoundland. But because I traveled, like I worked in six or seven different countries and traveled in over 100. And it's like places like India, Portugal, Costa Rica, South Africa, Japan. They ha have their, like, their own architecture, their own identity. And I always kept checking back to Newfoundland. It was like the more I, I was away, the more I appreciated the uniqueness and the individuality in Newfoundland. And then when I did get the call, it was, uh, I think Zita chose me. She interviewed like 50 architects, but she, um, I think she said one time it was because I had as much to lose as she did if it went wrong. So she knew um, wow. I would give it a, everything. I, I gave my heart and soul to that project. So it's a big, it's a big part of me, but uh, you know, it, for better or worse, like I mentioned in the film, like, Whatever we did or whatever we designed would affect the future of that place forever. And luckily, and I knew in the bottom of my heart that this would go well. And luckily, it's created some amazing change. And, um, you know, there's people been there. David Letterman's been there. Gwyneth Paltrow, the Prime Minister of Canada. There's some, there, that's like one part of it. Then but there's one very interesting people from all around the world like the producers have come from away i walked them around to the four studios we spent the whole day with them i love the one that you designed that is for writers you just walk right in and there's the desk overlooking the window and it's like how could you not create in this space yeah it was uh, the ex uh, was the ceo of the national gallery of canada he it's, it's actually called the bridge studio but it was it was actually designed for writing studio oh. and but no one knew that. But he walked into the door when he was there, and someone he said, "Just blur it right." He goes, "I want to, I want to sit down and write a book here." Mm. So it's made for that one. There is that's getting back to the needs again. It's like that one was the only studio made for a specific art type, which is writing. And then we just said, "What do you need?" It was like a desk, a chair, a place to put your pencils, a place to lay your paper, a little seat by the fire, and that was it. It's just so wonderful. I hope that you've got one tricked out with acoustics so, you know, somebody like me or you can sit uh, down and do yeah, some broadcasting yeah. from there. Yeah, that's right. I think all of them can be used for that, actually. There, that, that was the one uh, interesting thing is when I'm designing houses, they're like 
bespoke and tailor-made to the person. This is one of the first projects I did where everyone had to be right. a possible user. And that, that was why the inn worked so well. We had a collaborative process where everybody's opinion was equal because everybody could be a possible guest. How do you get there? Yeah, you can fly Toronto to Gander, I think, uh-huh. directly now. And then uh-huh. from New York, it's New York, St. John's, Gander, and then drive out from there. Oh, you drive. Yeah, okay. there's a there's a private airplanes can land on the, on the runway in Fogo, which is just like five minute drive from the inn. So a lot of people a lot of people do that. We're back in a moment with architect, son of Newfoundland and Labrador, and now resident of Norway, Todd Saunders, who will tell us why he's glad there's not a Canadian flavor, if you will, when it comes to our architecture. Enjoying real time? Well, we hope so. And thank you. And a reminder to subscribe wherever you love your podcasts for monthly episodes with guests who share ideas that we promise will resonate with you long after the closing theme has played. And don't miss our next episode with TSN's own James Duthie about the art of conversation. Now back to Todd Saunders. Now, Todd, you've talked about all of the different countries in which you've worked. With this global perspective, mm. what can you tell us about Canadian architecture? Mm. Is there a Canadian flavor? Um, I think there's a Canadian attitude, and thank God there isn't a Canadian flavor. And that's, I'll explain why. I was the judge for the National Architecture Prize in Canada, which is called the Governor General's Award. Mm-hmm. And I'd been away for years, and they just asked me to join. So I was in Ottawa, and they were presenting, I think they presented 100 projects that were being made in Canada. And it reminded me a bit of Norway because Norway is a very long country, very monotone culturally, like the people, one language, and 95% of the people are Lutheran. But in Canada, it was like this, it's also a large country, but very multicultural. Norway has a very, there's a lot of different architecture here and a lot of different personalities in the architecture, which I really prefer. And I saw the same thing in Canada. I saw these young companies do spectacular work. It was it made me so happy to see the high quality and um, I wouldn't say individuality, that's not the right word, but uniqueness. Like it was very specific to place, like hyper specific. And that's what I, I hope the style, like we call it a style or a flavor of Canada. I think that would be the best thing Canada can do is just be very, very, very specific to where you're working on. And that's what I tell these architecture students I work with I I gave my the lecture at Yale last fall when I was teaching there and I ended off by saying you know everybody's looking at these so-called star architects um, Mm -hmm. and then they're working all around the world but I I said you know it's like one part of it but the real joy I got out of the project was actually focusing on one place like Fogo Island and then really going deep and I encourage them to find, you know, you can do your projects all around the world, but maybe find one place you really, really love, like a community, and put a lot of effort in there. Use a lot of time, build up relationships, and really go deep. Because uh, And then I think Voltaire talked about it. He said, uh, cultivate your garden. And that's what he meant. Mm. It was just use the time to get to know the garden where you 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 plant, and you can it's your whole life you can put into there. You can take what you learn from these other projects, but bring them back to that one place, and then focus on being hyper specific, um, and then trying to create an architecture to that adds to a place and that people are proud of and people love. And architecture gives instead of takes. In that way, I think there's a great tie-in and a familiarity with realtors in that it is about connection and connection with community. Yeah, and I think that's what I I see it swinging back. Like the younger generations of architects just behind me, are they have their very values. I see it in my oldest daughter. It's 15. They're they're different. They're like buying all their clothes secondhand on these apps online. There's a there's a new economy coming out of this. There's a new value set set of systems, and uh, so I, I kind of I see hope actually that uh, the city I lived in was actually there was like shops everywhere on the corners when I first moved here like 20 years ago, and now like 7-Eleven and Starbucks owns every one of them. Right. And, uh, but it's still turn, it's not, and then the city's not allowing people advertise like companies in the public spaces. And there's a resistance to it. 
And now there's like there's a uniqueness in this city that's uh, that I think it will survive. You see in St. John's, Newfoundland as well, there's a lot of peculiar, interesting little shops there. Copenhagen has got that. And I think the world craves uh, this multifaceted, diverse things. And I think we went through a phase where Starbucks and 7-Eleven were taken. I, th- I think that's on its way out, hopefully. And I think that's where architects and realtors can play a role. I love that we seem to be seeing the changes of, you know, you talk about your daughters buying clothes secondhand and that there's this new economy. It's like turning old industrial areas, seeing old factories becoming homes and seeing porches making a comeback and outside yeah. spaces. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, that's really, it's like, makes it much more interesting. See, I think the one, there's one thing that the realtors probably know and people are interested in interesting neighborhoods. Yeah. Like, for example, Kit Solano and Vancouver and certain areas in Toronto and Montreal. And I think people are buying into neighborhoods now as much as they're buying a specific piece of real estate because the neighbors, neighborhood is becoming the living room. You can actually build smaller and your gym is the parks and stuff like that. So I think uh, uh, like if architects and planners can make better neighborhoods than the, the, and with a good variation of architecture, I think. Uh, I think, yeah, I, I definitely know that the statistics with the real estate agents here, there's certain neighborhoods that um, the houses sell quicker and stuff like that. There's like mm. two or three areas in Bergen here that's young people in their 30s and 40s, and they're staying there. They're kind of buying places and uh, they're not moving. They're really enjoying the neighborhoods. And now you're designing homes for people who are in their 70s and up, and you get joy out of that? I love it. Like my best clients are over seventy. I just love it because they're like uh, it's their last house, and they're they know how to make decisions. They've been living in other places. Um, it's actually harder to design for younger, like the thirty-year-old couples. If they're not well synced and know each other, it's, it's kind of difficult to design for them. But the like the ones over 50, 60 gets easier. Seventy gets even easier. And then I've done one couple with uh, they're both in their 80s just they're just turning 80 right now and then um, uh-huh. that, that was fantastic such a joy to work with them yeah. and you enjoy one story houses tell us why this is such an insight into architecture that i hadn't even considered yeah it's like a number of reasons it's but they're kind of easier to solve and they're much more playful like a stair for example no one really mm-hmm. knows that if you move a stair in a house you might as well start all over again you move a few rooms around and stuff like that, but as soon as you move a stair in a house design, then you kind of really got to stick and move it, adjust it a little bit. But once you move it more than so much, you might as well start off with a whole new house. Yeah, stairs actually take up a lot of square footage without even you knowing it, so it creates like hallway spaces. And uh, but at the same time, we we do uh, some verticality in some of the houses. But I, I really started to enjoy the one story houses. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. with uh, with annexes, where you have the core rooms in one part, and then there's a, an annex or a guest bedroom or a garage or some or a, like a yoga studio or or some other pod, which is connected by a roof, and you create this like covered outside space between these two or three different elements. That's where it gets fun. We're starting to do more of that and stuff like this. You can work on Zoom, yeah, and you don't have to travel that much anymore. And as we speak to you, you're sitting in your library in your home. And of course, it's all about multifunction now, which is probably something that you always did embrace. And you've spoken about it, you know, the parts of the house that are the gym or the home office or the guest room. Yeah. You know, having houses where wellness is also integrated, like for meditation and mm-hmm. and getting mm-hmm. well and, and allowing the light in. Yeah, it's kind of like a house is a uh... It's a refuge in a way, yeah. but it's kind of, I'm kind of getting away from the single family houses. We do them, but we're working more on town planning stuff now. So I kind of, that's, that's where my love is because like, my undergrad is environmental town planning and it's, and you can't really get a commission doing a town plan when you move to Norway at 26 years old. So now mm-hmm. at my age, we're starting together. We're doing a, a creative community outside of Atlanta, Georgia right now. Um, we're working on a second home community with uh, live workspaces outside of Bergen right now. It's like 47 different units that we could use, but we're designing it in a way that looks like three different pieces. And it's based on this old traditional grouping of farmhouses that's quite eccentric and unique to Norway. Hmm. 
But I'm, I'm more interested in designing neighborhoods. I, I would love to design a car-free neighborhood ah. somewhere in Canada. Like the first off-the-grid car-free neighborhood. Like that would be a dream. And I think it's possible. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of institutional barriers to these things. But fortunately, some of the really eccentric architects are getting in. There are actually town planners in cities now, and there's a lot more openness. So uh, I think we're in for some really interesting types of projects coming up soon. Well, what changes or trends, Todd, have you been seeing in Canadian architecture that inspire you today? Um, I, th- because of COVID, I haven't been home that much. Like, uh, um, g- Just generally in the world, there's, um, there's this drive for, towards uniqueness and like, interesting and different is I think that's the key now. I think people are tired of waking up in a hotel in some city and there's a five-second moment where you don't know where you are. Right. Yeah, and I think that architecture has a role to play on that. Like, why travel anymore if everything looks the same? Yeah. I spent a week now in this town, Bergerac, in France. It was Mm -hmm. fantastic. And then I was just down there working and observing people, little town squares and the history there and getting to know the waiter and the yoga teacher and stuff like that. When we wrap up with Todd Saunders, how the givers are the greatest and why word of mouth is the best advertising here or anywhere else in the world. In your world, there's no better tool than Realtor.ca. Whether you're looking to connect with local leads, grow your network, or find valuable content for your audience, Realtor.ca has you covered. Visit Realtor.ca today. Reliable real estate resources all under one roof. There's a high degree of trust established between realtors and their clients, and I'm sure that's the case for you, too. I found it fascinating to learn that you have never paid for advertising. Uh, once. We, that was a couple of months ago, actually. I got tricked into it. Ah! That was an airline magazine. Oh. Did a profile in Scandinavia. Yeah, I've never, I think in 25 years, have we ever paid for ever. We've, we're like this. We've been, I, I do a lot of interviews and, uh, I mean, this is actually giving away information. Oh. I, my last book is called Share. Yeah. Um, it's an interview with 30 Nordic architects that's coming out this fall. And it's, it's like 99 questions that I always wanted to ask other architects because they were like starting my own company and what it was like. And I did those 99 questions and I asked these 30 architects, most of my friends, and uh, ask them to answer three questions, and it turned into these great interviews. And that's like giving the information away. I think that's more people don't understand it. It's like you're getting called by advertisers all the time and salespeople. They just want to take. It's like it's the wrong way. If you want to get something, it's the givers of the world that come furthest. Even though it's in this hyper economic society of selfies and stuff like that. Everyone thinks it's the takers that get the most, but it's the takers. And uh, if you give without expectations, then you get a lot more in return. And I think that's why we never really, we've always been open to talk about our architecture, we create high quality things. That's another thing. If you do good stuff, people will want it. Yeah. And they want to pay for it. And then they want to learn about it. And then if, if you're a person that has those qualities and you're willing to give away and share, you gain a lot of it. It seems to work for, for us. Oh, it sure does. And going back to what you said, too, that integrity is your currency, which, of course, translates to realtors so well. So let's, as we begin to wrap this up here, Todd, what would you consider your key to successful client relationship management? So there's a lot of layers to that. You mentioned the word trust. Trust is not a given. Like I, I have a lot of discussions about this. Trust is like a layers of shared experiences. And then we use time with clients and the trust gets built up and we deliver. We're reliable. It's a big part of trust. We're predictable. And what we say, we do. I think that's another tip for realtors. And then we never overpromise. And then uh, we align our expectations very early along. Like uh, I'm always asking questions and then we very rarely draw to like the third or fourth meeting. It's a lot of asking questions and finding out things. And when you understand another person, when you feel you understand what they need, 
and you focus on that, then it's easier to make decisions. But there's too many architects coming to the board. I don't know if it's for real estate agents, but they come with a preconceived idea and they're shoving it down other people's throats and they're, it's like they're pushing their ideas and they're not listening. So listening is a huge part of this. And it's kind of ironic because I'm in a podcast and I'm just talking. <laughs> but the listening and then asking good questions and then this curiosity I think that's why we do quite well. And then I tell the people on the team that when you're in conversations with people, it's not about making the best design. It's not about making the most money. It's about building up relationships. And if you build up a good relationship, it's a fantastic thing. I was on an airplane a while ago. It was like 12 years after my dad had died. And uh, and the pilot actually gave me a favor because my dad used to fix his plane. And it's like, it's a relationship that's like, you know, it's my dad did something good for someone hmm. 20 years ago and then someone else still remembers. And I think that's, uh, that's a lot to do with anyone in business, I think. Real estate, architects, selling books at a store. It's like the personal connection you make with people is it's extremely valuable. It is. It is. And Todd, one final, final note here. Yep. What is one thing that you suggest to someone who is listening right now that they can do to become more attuned to the architecture around them? Uh, I'd say walk slower. Hmm. Like the value of just taking a walk around your neighborhood. And that's what probably saddens me the most about the way Canadian and North American cities are designed. They're not experienced up close. I think a walk, like walking around your neighborhood. I was just in Mexico City. I kind of missed my plane to Fogo, and then I said, ah, hell with it. I'm just going to stay in this neighborhood called Condesa. Mm-hmm. And I walked like an hour in each direction. I could feel like I know that. It was a beautiful architecture. So walking and uh, yeah, observing, being curious. Taking a break. Todd, we can't thank you enough for your time, your consideration, your immense talent, and for everything that you've done to bring Canada to the fore. You're an incredible ambassador for this country, even as you work abroad and make your mark in all of the different communities in which you plan and you build. So thank you for that. Yeah, thanks for that. That was very kind. Thank you. Once again, I can't recommend highly enough that you search out and watch the documentary Strange and Familiar Architecture on Fogo Island and see and hear our guest Todd Saunders in and about that inn. You really have to see it to appreciate Todd's magic and his vision. It's glorious. Join us for episode 28 of Real Time when a career television broadcaster talks about the art of conversation, the most important element in that vital part of your business, and so much more. TSN's James Duthie will be our guest on Real Time, so don't miss it. Real Time is an Alphabet Creative Production brought to you by CREA, the Canadian Real Estate Association, technical producer Rob Whitehead, and Real Family Productions. And I'm Erin Davis. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll talk to you again soon on Real Time. <laughs>